Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we pray for a blessed time tonight as we learn about uh, Paul's missionary journey. We're thankful for the word of God, which is able to teach us the life of Paul's ministry. May you encourage us and challenge us so that we too can take on the example of Paul and learn lessons that you want to teach us. Yes. So may your Holy Spirit be a teacher and a guide mm -hmm. tonight, Lord, and guide us into the blessed truth of your precious word. Once again, cleanse our hearts from all our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord that we can come and look into the account of Paul's first missionary journey. I just want to uh, start off by encouraging all of us that when we are talking about the missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, let, let us be open to, to the Lord's leading for our lives in the work of uh, the ministry, be it missions or otherwise. But specifically, we are talking about missions tonight because it is Paul's missionary journey. And so I just want to encourage all of us here. Uh, you may be younger in age and God help you to have the joy of service for him in the area of missions also. And should the Lord call you into the area of missions, you be willing to go and serve the Lord in a full-time ministry as a missionary. So you be open to the call to serve the Lord in missions. I know that missions is a tough work because I speak for myself. I have gone to missions myself. I've uh, gone into operation mobilization for one year. I sailed on the ship for six months, visiting many countries in the Asia area. And then I live in India for six months. And I was uh, with OM in India, specifically working with the Indians in uh, the northern part of India in a state called Uttar Pradesh, UP. I'm sure some of you would know uh, UP. So we had a very big uh, outreach work in 1974. That was so long ago. And I remember UP 74 and we were there and we lived in uh, UP for three months. We were doing the work of the ministry in UP. So praise the Lord for that opportunity to serve the Lord in missions. And then the other three months, I traveled around India and in the OM trucks. And then we <laughs> went into many churches and so forth to do the work of uh, outreach. So it's a tough work. I know uh, as you know, all of you, if you are called into missions, just be prepared to do the work of, mi uh, of missions also. Uh, I remember a Korean pastor, especially the wife, one day spoke to me. And she, she has this to say, you know, she said that in Korea, when the Lord called somebody to do the work of missions, the fellow will respond so quickly. He will go to the work of missions. But because she lives in Singapore for many years, uh, she said when the Lord speaks to the Singaporeans, it takes them a year or more to decide whether to go into the work of missions or not. And they have so many things to think about before they go into the uh, work of missions. Well, whatever it is, it is tough work. It is where the Lord is going to lead you and you be prepared to go into the mission field. All right. So we also ask the Lord to protect us as we go into the, the missions ministry. Now, take a look at what we're going to go through today as we look at the years in which Paul would travel in the first missionary journey. Actually, his first missionary journey is about four years, you know. Took him about four years to complete the missionary journey. And only cover two chapters in the book of Acts chapter 13 and 14. We'll cover a bit of Acts chapter 15 if we have the time. Uh, a bit on Acts chapter 15 because Paul went back uh, after the first missionary journey to Jerusalem and there he uh, shared forth what the Lord has done in the work of missions and that's what we have to do. Uh, we have to give an accountability, an account of what we have done in the work of missions also. All right, so let's jump into the teaching now on the life of Paul in his missionary journey 
And here we have the travelers who went with him in this work of missions. Take a look at them. Uh, the miles that is uh, stated down there, distance travel is 14, uh, 1,400 miles. And if you translate it into uh, kilometers, it's 2,253 kilometers of travel. We notice that he travels by, by boat. He travels on, uh, by foot most of the time. And then uh, it will take him a long time to travel. So his first missionary journey was about four years in, uh, in time, uh, in, the, in the total time of his work. Take a look at the people who went into this work of missions with him. There you have Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. That's very interesting. We have these three people who does the work to get, I mean, these three people who were called of the Lord uh, to do the work of missions. And of course, later on, when you come to uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 13, you have Mark, John Mark who left the, the team. But we'll come to it later on. But just for this point here, missions, the task of missions is a group task. If possible, go as a group. If possible, go as a family. If possible, go as a couple. All right? You try not to go as an individual in the work of missions. If possible, just go with someone to do the work of missions. And I think that is important because here we have the first missionary journey and here we have these three people who are doing the work together. You will need the support of one another. You will need the encouragement from each other. Uh, you will need the prayer support of one another. Of course, we talk about the prayer support from the church, but it's not only the church, but it is your fellow missionaries who are with you in the work of missions. All right. And then missions is going out to uh, places that perhaps we have never been to before. It is, it is really going out of our comfort zone. I, I think we're very comfortable in, in uh, many of our countries. I think for us in Singapore, we're very comfortable in, in our country. But when we ask to go out to places like India and Nepal and whatever, all these places is a bit tough for us. But we need to do and we need to go out also to these places. And so it is getting out of our comfort zone and going to places we are not familiar with. And we're not familiar with the food in that place. We're not familiar with the culture, the weather, and, you know, the people and so forth. So we are, we are really uh, going into a place that really is sort of unknown to us. Of course, we do our studies before we go to these places. We prepare ourselves to go to these places. All right. But take note, it is really going out of our comfort zone. And then, of course, if you talk about distance travel that is mentioned down here, you are going to distance places. Missions means going out of, uh, of, your, of, of uh, not only your comfort zone, but from the place that you have been living for so many years, you know, in your country. And you really have to move from uh, Singapore to another part of the world and you have to uh, do the work of missions. Let's move on. See? The first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, Antioch in Syria, that's the place in which they started the missions. And we have the passage in scriptures in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. I will just give you these pictures first. Holy Spirit sets apart Paul and Barnabas to preach the word of God. And then, of course, John Mark came along as their helper. And they set off from Antioch to this place called Seleucia, right? Antioch is in this place that is uh, Turkey today. Let me read for you from God's word down here in the book of Acts chapter 13. I think it's important we go into the scriptures and understand what the word of God is teaching us over this matter of missions, all right? And, and you listen uh, as I read for you this passage here and just do a little commentary here. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Take note, prophets and teachers. And who were the prophets and teachers? You have one person by the name of Barnabas. And there you have 
one of the key leaders of the church in Antioch was none other than Barnabas himself. Then you have this person by the name of Simeon, who was called, sometimes they call his name Niger, sometimes, of course, we call his name Niger. All right. But there are some people who will call and put his name as Niger. And because of that, you, you would know that here was a man who was uh, sort of uh, black in color, you know, dark skin in, in color. Simeon, if you take note of it, nah, Simeon was one of those people whom, who, who went to Jerusalem, if you remember, and he was the one who saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was the one most probably would have been, uh, you know, asked to carry the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? This, this is a person that is mentioned down here. Simon, who was called Niger or Niger. Lucius of Cyrene, and that would be in a place that uh, Simeon would come from, uh, come from also. And you have another person by the name of Menaan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetra. Okay? And then in verse 2, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Huh? And then in verse 3, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So take note of it down here. You have the first part down here, which I'm going to show you. You can see the cursor moving down here. The Holy Spirit is the one who sets these people apart. So Acts chapter 13 verse 1 tells us that these people who were going to the work of missions have been called to do the work of missions. They have been set apart by God to do the work of missions. I know that there are people who says, I'm ready to go into the mission field, but not call of the Lord yet. You know, I don't have any call from God, but I want to go into the mission field and serve the Lord. And that's where the church must come into the, the scene and talk to the person and see how the Lord is leading the person and so forth. All right. And uh, then determine if really the person has been called to do the work of missions. I've got people in, in, in my church that's a long time ago. And uh, one day there's this lady who came up to uh, me and, and told me, Pastor, I'm going I'm actually uh, desiring my heart to go into missions. Say, yeah, okay, what, what's the mission field that you want to go to? She mentioned the mission field. And it happens to be a place in which the boyfriend is there. You know, the boyfriend is there. And I, and I, and I asked her together with the church leaders, are you called to do the work of missions in this place? Well, that's where the Lord wants me to go. <laughs> you know, that kind of things. So I think we have to be very careful mindful as to how the Lord has called us into the work of missions. It's not because my boyfriend is there, my girlfriend is there, or my, you know, I have some vested interest in that place, you know, and so forth. But there is the special calling for these people to do the work of missions. I've got a member in my church, uh, a lady who has been called to do the work in, in one part of, of, uh, of China. And that, that's a very uh, a big place. And she had went to that place and served the Lord for 20 over years in the mission field there. And I was thinking, wow, how can she survive all these 20 years? And that's the thing, calling. That's most important, calling. And so we see in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, these people who were called by the Lord, set apart by the Holy Spirit, and they went forth. But before they went forth, you want to... Take note from the scriptures down here. They were the people who were commissioned by the church. That's in verse 3. All right. They were committed, uh, commissioned by the church. The church was the one who uh, sent them forth. After fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So this is the thing about missions. Missions is where the person has been called of the Lord. The Lord impressed upon the person and says, this is the field I want you to go. And then this person has that confirmation from the Lord. 
And that is where the church comes into the, the scene and the church says, yes, this is where the Lord is leading you. We will commission you to do the work of missions and you will go into the mission field. And you notice down here, then the Holy Spirit says, set forth, set forth who? These are the people you, you will, uh, you know, send them forth into mission. And what uh, the scriptures tells us is that there was this man by the name of Barnabas. He is one of the key teachers in the church. In other words, we're supposed to send the best into the mission field, you know. That's the thing that we need to do. Send the best into the mission field. Not people that we don't want them to be in the church anymore. Lah. Okay, lah, go into the mission field. No. Let them go into the mission field and, and that's, that's, that's about it. No, we have to send the best. When, when my church started in 1976, uh, Grace Church, we established this ministry of Shalom Bible Presbyterian Church. And, and Grace Church gave the best of people to go there to serve in the, in the field. That's their pioneering work. When we started Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church, we also sent the best of these people. My elder went there to do the work together with them. And these people were the best in the church. They were the leaders in the church and they went to do the work of missions. So I want you to take note down here that we have to give the best, the best of people to go into the mission field to do the work of missions, right? And don't, don't, don't give the second best, okay? Give the best to serve the Lord in the work of missions. I think that's, that's uh, the uh, point that I want to make down here for all of us. Okay, then the Bible tells us, of course, John Mark went, went along with them and so forth. We'll see the trouble later on. But let's, let's move on to see the account down here. From Antioch, they went to this place called Seleucia. There you can see the red <laughs> arrow, the little arrow there. There you see that. It's a very sharp place, isn't it? Seleucia is the port city. And uh, they went to this port city in which they traveled to uh, Cyprus. Let's move on. Now they will enter into Cyprus. That's their first missionary journey into Cyprus. I'm going to give you all the words down here first. They sailed from Seleucia to Salamis and Paphos on Cyprus. In Paphos, Paul confronts the sorcerer named Elimus and blinds him. And from this point, the Bible calls him Paul rather than Saul, right? Now take note of this passage from scriptures. This is, this is the account from the book of Acts chapter 13 and look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came down to Seleucia, and from there, they sail to Cyprus. And then in verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist him. That is John Mark. Right? Cyprus was an imperial Roman province. You take note of that, huh? It's lots of Romans down there at that time. And Cyprus was the home of Barnabas. That's interesting. Barnabas was going back to his home, hometown. He was from Cyprus. Acts chapter 4, verses 36 to 37. Let me read for you in Acts chapter 4. Okay, verses 36 to 37. I'll read for you here. Verse 36 says down here, Then Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite and a native of Cyprus. So we have God's word to confirm this matter down here. He was from Cyprus. Okay, this is important. We take the word of God 
and then we see it from the word of God. Cyprus was the home of Barnabas. And then we see down here that they sailed from this place, Seleucia to Salamis. Let me just mention something about uh, this place. Huh? Let, let me get my notes down here. Uh, Salamis is a place that they preach in the synagogue, the Bible tells us. But I want you to take note that in this place, Salamis, today, if you go to that place, which I have not gone to, I have not been to Cyprus before, but I wish to go to Cyprus one day. There in Cyprus, specifically in this place called, uh, called Salamis, we have uh, a church called the Church of Barnabas. Interesting, huh? And it stands over the supposed burial site of Barnabas. That's what they claim. Where did he die? Where did Barnabas die? No, nope, the Bible never recorded at all. But then, of course, this is all tradition that is mentioning about this part down here. All right. But Salamis is a very important place. From Salamis, they were able to uh, preach the word of God because in Salamis, there was this place called the Agora. If you go into the Greek and look into the word Agora, it means a marketplace. There was a marketplace and there was a place where there were a lot of people meeting and Paul and Barnabas had the opportunity to share the word of God to these people. And then, of course, the Roman street was there, the road, but there was paved by the Romans. Even until today, you can see the, the pavement of the road there. And that road is a very important road because it connected uh, Salamis to Paphos. So one end of the island to another end, they were able to travel. No problem at all because of the roads that have been built by the Romans. All right. Then, of course, in Salamis, there was this theater where the people can come together for entertainment and so forth. And so when we think about this place called Salamis, it is a place of, uh, of busyness. People have been there. They, you know, the, the boats would have come down to that place there and lots of business, business in this place in Salamis also, right? And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 13 and verse 5, the, the Bible says that they were uh, preaching the, the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. That's interesting. When Paul went there, the first thing is he did was to go and preach the word of God to the people in uh, Salamis. And then he went also to this place called Paphos. Take note of the, the, this part down here. In Paphos, they went. So it's actually one place to another place. One end of the island to the other end of the island. Traveling is quite easy because of the Roman roads. They have uh, paved up that place and they were able to travel quite uh, easily. And so in Paphos, the Bible tells us that they were, uh, they were confronted by a sorcerer. But take note of this place, Paphos. Paphos was known for its immorality. That place, Paphos, has been known for its immorality. And they worship Venus. Venus is the goddess of sex. They worship the goddess of sex. And so we see... Uh, Paul and Barnabas doing this work in Paphos. Now, verse 5 tells us that John Mark came into the scene with them, isn't it? John Mark came along in this missionary journey. And verse 5 tells us John came to assist them. John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. Then, we see in Acts chapter 13, go back to Acts chapter 13, and we see from verses 6 to 12 in Paphos, what actually happened in Paphos. Uh, let me read for you from verse 6. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a false, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the pro council. Sergius, Sergius, Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul 
and sought to hear the word of God. Oh, so we have these names of the people mentioned here. You have Elamus, who was called by Jesus. He was a sorcerer. And here we also have the person by the name of Sergius uh, Paulos. And he was the Roman pro council, right? I read for you, uh, going all the way to verse 12. The Bible tells us, then the pro council believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The Bible tells us that Elias, El Elimus, the magician, was opposing all in the missions ministry. Now, take note with me, when we do missions work, be prepared for the devil to engage us. Don't take mission work lightly. Don't say, I'm, I'm just, you know, a missionary and I'm just going into the field to preach the word of God and, and that's about all and I'm coming back. No, beloved, when you go into the mission field, you're going into the front line in battle. And when you go into front line of any battle, be prepared for the devil to hit you. And it was seen in the scriptures down here. From Acts chapter 13, from verse 6 down to verse 12, you have this man coming into the sin. He was an agent of Satan and he was hindering the work of evangelism. He was trying to do that with all the help that he can get from uh, the devil himself. Let me read for you verse 8. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith. That's the thing. The devil will take, take you and the devil will engage you. The devil will do that in the work of missions. So be prepared to do this work. And, you know, when, whenever you take on this task, pray that the Lord will protect you, your loved ones back home, and uh, so that the Lord will take care of all of us, all of the, 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 uh, your family and so forth, and then do the work of missions. But I also want you to see in verse 12 that the first convert, in the missionary, in the first missionary journey of Paul, was none other than this man by the name of Sergius Paulos. He was the first convert, and he was the Roman pro council. That means he was the governor. He was the governor, and he was the one who came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So be prepared for the work of uh, missions, in that God is not going to use you only. The devil is going to come after you and the devil is going to hit you very, very hard. If he can, he will seek to discourage you and he will hit your family also. All right. So that's the task of missions that I want you to take note of. All right. Now let's move on here. Let's move on to see this part. Let me see. Did I miss something no i didn't miss something this is the part that you want to see the arrow on the right there you can see that it moves from salamis to Paphos. he goes from antioch to Cilicia to salamis and to Paphos. and you can see is from one end of the island to the other end of the island then the Apostle Paul went to do the work of missions. Okay. Now let's go into this part here. Pergas. Let me just get this part here. Uh, let me get this. Perga in Pamphylia. This is where John Mark departs a desert, the group, and returns to Jerusalem. Barnabas and Paul travel on to Perga in Pamphylia, which is Turkey today, and then on to Antioch in Poseidon. Right? Let me just read for you from God's word again. Just from Acts chapter 13 and verse 13. 
Now Paul and his companion set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now let me go back to the map again. You can see this picture of Paphos. And then they travel all the way to Perga down here. You can see my cursor moving down here. All right. After the map will show you the arrow, it will come to this place. And this is the place in which they will be traveling from Perga, Antioch, and Lestra, Iconium, Derby, and then moving on to do the work of missions. Now, here we have John Mark who departed from them. Perga was a coastal town, a harbor city, and they landed in Perga and really they didn't do very much in Perga. And then of course they went off, went on straight because they, they needed to go to the port city and from the port city, they move up north. But look with me at 1313, okay? Acts 1313. We don't have any reason that is given over this matter of uh, Mark who left them. We, we don't know why he left them. No, no reason. And given at all from the scriptures. Scripture is, is silent about this matter. But we all know that Paul was very uh, upset about the whole, whole matter. If you go into the book of Acts chapter 15, uh, let me just read for you Acts chapter 15 and verse 37. Later on in the second missionary journey, uh, we see Paul wanted to, um, Barnabas wanted to bring uh, Mark along, and Paul disagreed to them. I read for you Acts chapter 15 and verse 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other Barnabas took Mark with them, with him, and sailed away to Cyprus. Well, that's the account that is mentioned about the Apostle Paul who disagreed with Barnabas. And there was a big split between the two of them. But let's come back to this part of Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Why did, Paul, why did John Mark depart from the group? And then he returned to Jerusalem. He actually returned to the place in Jerusalem because he lived in Jerusalem. And uh, the scriptures is very clear that he lived in Jerusalem. His mother was there in Jerusalem and he went back to Jerusalem. Question people ask is this, uh, was he homesick when he went for missions? You can get homesick when you do the work of missions, but this is only a very short trip, you know, traveling only to uh, Greece, I mean to Cyprus and then he already gave up. Uh, haven't even really started the work of missions in that sense. He already gave up. And you have people like that today who give up this work of mission. So was he homesick? And you know, he gave up the missions. And uh, the other uh, reason people give is that, well, maybe because uh, Paul will be taking over as leader and Barnabas is not going to be the key leader anymore so he wasn't happy about it well that's another re uh, reason people give the other reason people give is that you know uh, he wasn't happy because Paul was going to reach out to the Gentiles whereas Mark and Barnabas was going for the Jews. They were reaching out to the Jews. They were going into the synagogue. They were trying to reach out to the Jews to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul went finally to the Gentiles. And that was the reason why Mark left. Well, this is uh, one of the three reasons they give. But there's another fourth reason that is given. And the fourth reason is, was it because of the toil in missions. It was tough doing the work of missions. John Mark was a young man 
when he went into the mission field. Later on, he matured very much. And later on, in one of the letters, Paul said, bring Mark along because he is useful to me. But when this man, you know, in the early parts of, of missions, was a very young man, he was maybe perhaps not that mature yet. And because of the toil in missions, because of the hardship in doing the work of missions, because they have to walk so much, and because, most importantly, because there was this danger in, in the mission field. Robbers were there, and you have uh, these people who give them trouble and so forth. And that's why Mark finally decided, that's enough for me. I'm not going into the mission field anymore. I'm going to read for you 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. This is what Paul said when he was in the work of missions. And he said this. He says in verse 26 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, that's the Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false prophets or false brothers. You see that? Lots of dangers in the mission field. You prepared for missions? Are you ready to do the work of missions? You prepared for it? If you go to a place that you are supposed to pioneer, like what Paul does, the work of pioneering work, is never an easy task. If we are building on what the, the early missionaries have done, then it may not be that difficult. But if you are doing the work of pioneering missions, specifically, it is tough. And I'm, I'm speaking to a lot of, of you today who are doing the work of missions, pastors and missionaries that I'm speaking, whether you are from Kenya, which I know Pastor Alex does that work. I know of people in, in, uh, in Nepal, in India, you know, and so forth. You're doing the work of missions. It is going to be a tough work and you have experienced the difficulties in the work of missions. I experienced it myself when I was living in India in the six months that I was there in the mission field. And we better be prepared for the work of missions. And the Bible tells us down here that John Mark deserted the group and returned to Jerusalem. My teaching to all of us is not only theology, but my teaching is devotional also. And I'm trying to tell us down here that we all have to be prepared of, for the hardship in the task of missions. And we have to ask the Lord to take care of us, protect us, because the devil will come in hard on us when we do the work of missions. First missionary journey, Paul encountered problems. Paul, I'm sure Paul would have been discouraged when he saw John Mark returning and Barabbas may have been discouraged also, but he's not told at all. But what we see in the scriptures was that Paul was very upset with the way this young man behaved. And he went back to Jerusalem. Barnabas and Paul traveled on to Perga in Pamphylia, and then they went off to Antioch in Poseida. Right? So this place in Perga was only a stopover. It was uh, a, a place that they needed to, to land and that was the place in which they will have to travel on to another place. There you see the, the arrow that goes up. See that? I'm showing you again. Arrow that goes up. And so he goes from Paphos to Perga and then he went up to Antioch. All right, let's move on. Antioch of Poseidon, Turkey today. Paul preaches his longest recorded sermon and many responded. And you can read for yourself because I'm, we will not have the time to read through 
his sermon here. You read for yourself from Acts chapter 13, verses 14 down to 52. And it's quite a long passage for you to read that pass, uh, the account of Paul doing the work in Antioch of Poseidon. But I just want to read for you just two verses. Acts chapter 13, verse 14 says, But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Poseidon. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. And verse 15 says, After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And the Apostle Paul in verse 16 stood up and motioning with his hand said to the people, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. And then he preached a very long message to the people in Antioch of Poseidon. And he preached in the synagogue from verses 14 down to 43. And then from verses 44 to 48, the next Sabbath, Paul also went to preach the word of God. And what happened was that the Jews were not happy with them. And because the Jews were not happy with the preaching of the word of God, the Bible tells us, Paul then said, I'm going now to the Gentiles to give them the word of God. This is where I want to read for you in verse 44. Acts chapter 13 and verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And since you trust it aside and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And that was what he did. He moved to the Gentiles and he gave the Gentiles the word of God. And in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believe. See that? They went finally to uh, the Gentiles. And then when you come to verse 49 down to 52, you will see down here that the Jews were giving them a lot of trouble. Let me read for you in verse 49. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecuting Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. That is what they did. And finally, there was this opposition that came against them. And the Bible tells us that they left the city. There you see the account down here. The Jewish leaders drive them out of the city. And they went out of the city. I've never come to this place before. St. Peter's Cave Church and so forth. It'll be interesting to be able to go to Turkey and see some of these places, but never mind. We can see it down here on, uh, on the photo already. Let's move on to the next one. Again, in Antioch of Poseidon, the Lord called Paul to focus his ministry on the Gentiles. I read to you just now. And then the Gentiles are glad and many became believers. Wow, that's wonderful when you see that. And leaving Antioch, Paul and Barnabas travel on to Iconium. This is where you see the picture in a map again. There, you see that from Antioch to Iconium. Quite a nearby place, isn't it? But I'm sure they have to travel so much and uh, it's a difficult uh, place to go and the traveling is, is tough for them, I'm sure. And so now we enter the book of Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 is where we see Paul in Iconium. All right. 
Okay, let me see in verse verses one to seven in Iconium. Let's go to Iconium and see that in Iconium, a great number of Jews and Greeks became believers. And then eventually, however, more plots forced them to flee to Lestra. All right. Just take note of this time in Iconium. It's a very uh, interesting place for us to take note because many people came to Christ. I read for you in Acts chapter 14, verse 1. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue. Every time when Paul had the opportunity, he goes in to preach the word. And he went into the Jewish synagogue every time. And spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Wow, he was a fantastic preacher, man. Now, some people say now that Paul wasn't a good preacher. You know? But whatever it is, good or not good preacher, whatever it is, the key thing is this. The Holy Spirit is the one who uses the word that is spoken from the Bible. All right? So you may be a preacher. And you are preaching the word of God. And I'm speaking to many preachers, I'm sure, today. I've, I've been a preacher myself for the last 40 years in my church. And when we preach the word of God, we leave it to the Lord to touch the hearts of the hearers. It is his word. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And we just preach the word of God and let the word of God be given and be sealed in the hearts of the hearers. And so the Bible tells us that the thing that Paul did was just amazing. He went, he straight away did that work. And the Bible tells us down here that opposition continued to be against Paul. I read for you in Acts 14 verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. See that? There you have opposition again and again in the work of missions. Always remember, in the work of missions and evangelism, you, will, you are in the front line of battle and you will find that you are always encountering the devil who will come against you with his agents. All right? And these people will be, uh, you know, going against you in so many different ways. And you better be prepared for that thing. The Bible tells us opposition in verse 2. Let me read for you now in verse 3. Verse 3 tells us of Paul, his boldness, and Barnabas, the boldness in preaching the word of God. The Bible tells us, so they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That's interesting. There you have signs and wonders is mentioned here. <clears throat> the first signs and wonders that Paul did going back all the way in his first missionary journey was in Cyprus. Remember? And he was the one who caused this man, this, this uh, Elimus, to be blinded. And that's the work of, of God's uh, grace upon Paul to do this, uh, this, this task. Signs and wonders. You know, when you do the work of missions, God is going to use you in this matter also. I'm not talking about charismatic signs and wonders. All right? Don't, don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand me over this thing. But I've seen signs and wonders in the work of missions also. Great and mighty work in which God has done. I've seen it. And in the work of missions, you will be able to see this kind of things. Specifically praying for people and specifically seeing the, the, the way in which God answers prayer. You can see it. All right. And here we see the Apostle Paul and Barnabas doing this work. And the Bible tells us it was accompanied by signs and wonders. This is what the Bible says. All right. And we have to just look into the word of God. And trust the word of God and says, this is what God's word uh, is doing in the lives of Paul and Barnabas. Right? And so, 
we move on to see in verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 says that they knew the trend to stone them. Verses 5 and 6 tells us, When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews, with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lestra and Derby, cities of the Lyconia, and to the surrounding city. And verse 7 says, there they continue to preach the gospel. Wow. There you see, they were prepared to do the work. But when they were prepared to do the work, opposition came upon them. Now, learn this important lesson. If there is a need to flee from that place, please do so. All right? Don't stand there and say, God is going to protect me. No. I think if there is a need to flee, run. Move away from that place. And you'll be very wise to do that. And that's what the Bible teaches us down here. Paul and Barnabas fled from the place of Iconium. Okay? Then, let's move on to see the next account down here. There you see from Iconium, where did they go to? Uh, you see the small arrow, Lestra, and also to Derby later on. Okay? But they went to this place in Lestra. Now, let, let me move on down here. There, Lestra is mentioned. This is a place where Paul continued to do great and mighty work. This is signs and wonders in the work of missions and evangelism. All right? When Paul heals a lame man, the town people think he and Barnabas are Greek gods. Paul and Barnabas tear their clothes and tell the people not to worship them. Okay? Let me just get this uh, person to be admitted first. Okay, let me go back and then I will mention to you down here in Lestra. This is the miracle in Lestra. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 down to uh, 18. And the Bible tells us that there was the lame man who was healed. It was a mighty miracle. And verses 8 down to 10. Let me, let me read for you this account down here. All right? Verses 8 to 10. At Lestra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well and said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprung up and began walking. Wow, that's fantastic. That's a mighty miracle. And then in verse 11, the Bible tells us that the people saw it. Verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices and said, saying in the Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now, when they spoke in the Lyconian language, the apostle Paul, together with Barnabas, couldn't understand what they were saying. All right? That was their dialect. And they couldn't understand what these people were saying. Paul, they called Zeus. and uh, Sorry, Barnabas, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker, and so forth. Well, the Bible tells us down here that a great miracle was done by the Apostle Paul. And the people saw them as gods in verses 11 down to verse 18. Barnabas, they call him Jupiter in verse 12. Paul, they call him Mercurius or Mercurius, Mercurius. And that would be Hermes, the son of Zeus. And of course, like I said, the apostle, as well as Barnabas, couldn't understand the Lyconian language at all. But it was very difficult to restrain the people from coming to say that these really are gods. And then I read for you down here in verse 18. Verse 18 says, Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. In fact, it is said that Paul and Barnabas stood up against them and says, don't, don't do these things, right? 
we are not gods at all. Don't do these things at all. But these people continue to do that. You see the, the, the way in which they, these people believe in their gods and their, their goddesses uh, during that time. And Paul was able to reach out to these people. It was pioneering missions. It was a tough work for them to do. Okay. Now, I'm going to move on to show you that the Jews from Antioch came, stirred the crowd, and Paul is stoned and left for dead. See that? Paul at Lestra. Paul survived, and the next day, he went on to Derby. The Jews from Antioch came down. I'm going to read for you in verse 19 and also in verse 20. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowd, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. That's interesting. He was stoned. And they thought that he had died. And the Bible tells us that Paul stood up. The, the, the disciples were surrounding Paul. And the Bible tells us that he stood up and he was alive. Amazing. And he went on the next day to Derby. That's an amazing thing for this uh, Apostle Paul. Now, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to give you some pictures of the way in which you can see how extreme the Jews can be. Okay. Now, look at this, this three men down here. This is the way that most of the Jews would dress themselves up. And of course, in those days, I don't know whether they dress that way or not. But you look at these little boxes up there on the forehead there. That's what we call the phylacteries, you know, the phylacteries. This is in the Western Wall. And they wear all these things and then up the sleeve down here. You see this guy wearing this thing? This is the phylactery. He wears it down here so that the word of God that is in this little box is close to his heart. Okay? It's close to his heart. He wears this phylactery, which is inside the word of God, is there, the Ten Commandments and so on and so forth. The word of God is always in his mind. That's the idea. All right. And so, today, if you go to Israel, you can dress up like this to take a photograph. <laughs> you, can, you can pose for a shot. And this is what the Tories were the ones who did that. They went to get the shots down here. Now I'm going to show you in a, a video now. Okay, I, I just want you to take note now, to mm -hmm. take a look at how this man behaved. Just, just take a look at how he behaved. Huh? Take a look at him, the way he behaved, he walks. See him doing that? And then he pays back. This is a Jewish guy, um, a guy with, with Judaism belief. He is walking backwards because he is facing the Western Wall. And when he faces the Western Wall, he is about to actually move away from the wall towards the entrance. He walks facing the wall and backwards when he walks and give his respect and worship to God before he goes off. Do you see that picture down there of this guy? He does that that way. Right? See how, how, how these people have been brought up in their, their, their belief in Judaism, strong in their belief in Judaism, Another one that I want to show you is this.
מלכות שמיים. אדוני מלך Okay, bar mitzvah. Heard of it before? This is where the young man comes to age, 13 years old, and they will be uh, a sort of an adult already to them. And they will be the ones to choose what they want to believe in uh, Judaism and how they can live out the, the Judaism uh, faith. The girls is what you call... Uh, Bet mitzvah, B-A-T, bet mitzvah. For the boys, is 13 years old. For the girls, is 12 years old. I want you to, to take a look down here and see that these people have been taught Judaistic belief when they're very young. And they continue to have that kind of belief. It, it, is, like, it is like Islam also, where the, the young has been brought up in the understanding of their faith. I, I think we, we Christians will bring up our children in that way also. But I think we lose out, you know, to, to, to many of us Christians. I think when we look into the context of Singapore itself, huh, there, there are a lot of, of, of Christians, parents especially, who really don't give the, the, the Christian faith the first priority. And I'm, I'm talking about putting Jesus first in their lives. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, the things that they are doing uh, is 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 wrong or what? I'm 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 sure there's a lot of uh, hearts desire for them to want to love the Lord and so forth, but they set their priority. I think uh, not so not so right uh, Many of them will put uh, education first. I'm I'm not against education. Uh, I'm 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 for education, but uh, they 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 will put that first. I think we need we need that. Of course, we need education and so forth, but. Sometimes uh, those things take first place rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's how the parents really need to be able to balance themselves over this matter on how they have to raise up their children in the way of the Lord. So when we talk about this matter of extremism uh, in the context of what you see in, in places like uh, uh, Iconium as well as Antioch, the Jews came and they, they really, they were fanatics over these things, fanatical in their belief. And they were raised up that way, just like Paul. Paul was a fanatic and he, he was raised up that way. And they would go all the way against the Christians. And in the context down here, you will see this young boy, this boy, 13 years old, and he will uh, be raised up in that, in that way, in that, that belief and so forth. And whether they will go against the Christian faith and so forth, we don't know. But if you go to Israel today uh, and share the gospel, you're not welcome to Israel. All right? You're really not welcome to Israel. Uh, in Israel, there are a lot of people who uh, say that, uh, especially the Christian says that they support Israel and they support Israel 100%. Uh, this group of people are called the Christian Zionists. Watch out for the Christian Zionists because the Christian Zionists uh, will give first priority to the to the to the Jews, but uh, I think when it comes to evangelism, the Jews will not want them to do. All right, so just watch out over this thing. I'm going to show you another video right now because this particular video that I'm going to show you has to do with the young guy who will do his bar mitzvah and he will read the scriptures in the Hebrew. This is the bar mitzvah for the young guy who will speak, who will read the, the scriptures in Hebrew. And at a very young age, they have been doing that already. Yeah. 
move on to this part here. After Lestra, they move on to Derby. Can you see the picture now there? They move on to Derby. Derby and the return trip. This is for Paul who will return finally to Jerusalem. While in Derby, Paul preached and many disciples are added to the church. And on the return trip to Antioch in Syria, they pass through these places again. Lestra, Iconium, Antioch, Pamphylia, Perga, and they went to another place by the name of Athelia. And then they appoint elders in the churches they had planted. This is found in Acts chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. I just read for you Acts chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. And when the disciples gathered about, he rose up. And then the Bible tells us they preached the gospel, verse 21, to that city and make many disciples. They went on to Derby. They preached the, the word of God. Verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and make many disciples, they returned to Lestra and to Iconium and to Antioch. And they strengthened the disciples in their faith and so forth. And so the Bible tells us then they return finally to Antioch. In verses 21 down to 25, they did that. Okay. And the interesting thing is this. Then they finally make sure that they appoint elders for their task. Verse 23 says that when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. See that this Apostle Paul, as well as uh, uh, well, Barnabas, did this task. They make sure that they have elders in the church. They do these things, right? Which they had planted. I think it's very important for the work of missions. The work of missions have always to uh, be done in, in, a, in a biblical way. That the church must have elders to continue to lead the church and to guide the church. And then, finally, they make their way back to Antioch. Take a look down here. From Derby, they went all the way. See? Going back all the way. Right? There's the big... You see, it goes all the way back there. And that's where Antioch in Syria. Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch, and they had to do a report. And they tell the people actually what happened in uh, that place that they went to do the work of evangelism. And while Paul was in Antioch, he wrote the letter to the Christians in Galatia. Paul and Barnabas then leave for Jerusalem via Phoenicia and Samaria. Right? That is in Acts chapter 14, verses 26 to 28. Uh, let, me, let me just show you from, from the Bible down here. And in verse 26 to 28, they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentile. And they remained no little time with the disciples. They were there for a long time with the disciples. The thing is this, 
go back to the home base, report to the home base the things that God had done. This is the task of the missions uh, group. Don't forget to do that. All right. Go back and share the account. And then the Bible tells us they went back to Jerusalem all the way. See that from Antioch going back all the way to Jerusalem. Okay. Then in Jerusalem, we are finishing already in AD 49. Paul and Barnabas report to the leaders in Jerusalem. And then we have Acts chapter 15 verses 1 to 35 on the problems that they have to face with the people in Jerusalem. You know, the, the problems of the Judaizers, the, the extremist group and so forth. Beloved, take note, missions is never an easy task to do. All right? Missions, you will encounter the devil coming against you. Missions, you will see the work of God using you in such a glorious and mighty way. And that is where you see signs and wonders. Amazing. Missions, you will be able to see the power of God. And when in missions, don't forget to know that the devil will be against you. All right. He will fight hard against you because you are establishing the, the, the kingdom of God. And in missions, you must take note that you do not leave the church standing on their own without any leadership at all. You must have the elders who will be brought up and they will be trained and they will be the people to lead the church. Whenever you come back from a missions ministry, give a report to the church, to the leadership, to the people. What you have seen, what you have done for the work of missions. You will have to do that task for the work. I'm going to show you just one more uh, video. And this video has to do with, with, uh, with Jerusalem. This is what we actually do in our study tour with Jerusalem University College. And you will see Dr. Jack Beck, who have uh, been leading us to do the work. I mean, been leading us in, in the study tour in Israel with Jerusalem University College, and he will be teaching. And just a very brief video down here to show you this account here. Kidron Valley. The building, uh, the Golden Dome is on which um, uh, piece of our map? Kidron Valley. Ah, okay. Can you see? Yep. Okay. okay. Carry on. Okay. Now, this is, this is Dr. Jack Beck teaching, and all of us are the students seated down here which we come from JUC and he's teaching us about the city of David, which is down here. This is the city of David, stretches all the way up and then coming up into this place, the, uh, the Solomon's temple later on, all right? And of course, there wasn't a Dome of the Rock and no Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, nothing of that sort. But let me just show you the video. Kidron Valley. The building, uh, the Golden Dome, is on which um, uh, piece of our map? Temple, Temple Mount. Temple Mount. And the city of David. So for the first time, we're kind of looking at the city of David from the side. So where the road is, go left, and you'll see, well, you'll see perhaps some people on the top of a tower, and then a retaining wall down below. That's where we're going to be tomorrow. That's the city of David Ridge. And you can see again, it's hard to pick out. It, it doesn't seem to stand out very well. Cut off on the east and west by the Kedron and the Central Valley, but we'll see that better. better. Um, anybody have notes? Okay. So this is the city of David down here. Stretches all the way up here. This is Jerusalem. And when we think of Jerusalem, we think of the apostle coming back together with Barnabas. And the Bible tells us they reported to the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem is the mother church, the key church, the main church in which the gospel goes forth to the world. All right. The gospel went forth to Antioch in Syria. And it was in Antioch in Syria. Then he started the work of missions, going into 
the places like Cyprus and then into Turkey. And then when we come to the second missionary journey next week, we will see Paul traveling not only in Turkey, but then, you know, he went as far as Greece to do the work of uh, missions. This Paul is just tremendous doing pioneering missions. He, he, he gave his whole life to do the work and uh, reaches out for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So praise the Lord for, for a man like this. And this is the last part in the book of Acts chapter 15. We see the problems that the Apostle Paul faced even in Jerusalem itself. So you can imagine uh, the work of missions never is without any trouble at all. The devil is really going all out to give trouble to the people uh, in missions. Now, this last part of the slides is this. At the Jerusalem Council, the apostles and other disciples discuss whether the new Gentile believers need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And after hearing Paul and Barnabas and of course Peter and James, council decided that they will not burden the Gentiles by making them become circumcised. And you can read that in the book of Acts chapter 15 and verses 23 to 29. And the letter formulated by the Jerusalem leaders and then taken to Antioch by Paul and Barnabas. And this time they were accompanied by Judas and Silas. And they were appointed by the apostles and the elders with the church. Now take note with me down here as I read for you in ending the last part down here in uh, verse 23. Let me read for you down here in verse 23. Uh, with the following letter, the brothers, both the apostles and elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. And since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words unsettling your minds, although we give them no instruction, it has seems good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same thing by the word of mouth. Tremendous, isn't it? These were the people who gave their whole life to do the work of missions, and they make sure that they went all the way out to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really amazing. As you see, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and then, of course, you have Silas later on coming to the scene to do the work of missions. I'm going to stop here. And uh, it's already 9, almost 9.20. If there's any questions from you, you may want to share or you may want to uh, ask, please do so.